Three, two. All right, and we are here again to uh, to talk some more uh, '80s, and we're going to talk some really cool stuff today. So we've been here once before, so we're kind of visiting another part of it. We came, we did Back to the Future a, a, a few episodes back. Yeah. Uh, today we're we're coming back to the future again, but this time to the second film. We're going to talk Back to the Future Part Two today, and we are joined by a very special guest uh, who played. Uh, George McFly in Back to the Future Part Two, Mr. Jeffrey Weissman. So let's welcome him to the show, and we'll be uh, we'll talk in him. Yeah, thanks for being here. Yeah, yeah thank thanks you, so Don, Kyle, Rich. Hi. Yeah. Hello, back. Thank you so much yeah. for uh, for joining us uh, here uh, on the show. Um, we're uh, we're really psyched to have you here because uh, we're all big Back to the Future fans, uh, and we are uh, always happy to. To, to talk to anybody that was involved in the movie and in any way. I, and I know you had a fairly I'm large... I'm a big fan of the films, too. Yeah. <laughs> and, and you had a very large, large uh, uh, contribution to the film by uh, taking on the role of George McFly in part two and part three. That was pretty pretty exciting, I'm sure. <laughs> it, uh, it was kind of a surprise to me. How, how did you get involved with it? I was uh, originally uh, approached, uh, asked if I could be a photo double. And uh, I had a, a lookalike agent give me a call, the, the first call to go in and have a meeting. And uh, I, I, I knew who Crispin was. I was a big, huge fan of his work already. Uh, I did a film with him in 1983 before he got the first Back to the Future film. Oh, cool. Uh, we did a, a film at the American Film Institute. And then uh, when Back to the Future came out, I didn't know he was in it. And when I saw him, I was like, that guy, fantastic. And I called him and congratulated him. And loved seeing that film. I was uh, co-starring that summer of 85 in a Western with Clint Eastwood called Pale Rider. Mm -hmm. Yep. And I wanted to go see what the other films were that that summer. And uh, I was already a huge Christopher Lloyd fan, like Michael <laughs> J. Fox from Family Ties. Mm -hmm. And then when I Crispin and I was like, hey, out of the park. Fantastic. It, absolutely. And, and so it was, it was a, like, of course, an instant hit. And I was a big fan when I got the call three years later to be a photo double stand in whatever they're going to have me do. Uh, little did I know that it was mostly because negotiations were falling apart with Crispin. Mm -hmm. And uh, I remember when I was up for it, meeting with the assistant directors and then going to makeup and special effects, uh, like body cast things and such. I, I called Crispin and said, you know, support me. I need the work. My, my ex-wife was having our second kid. <laughs> I needed my medical coverage. Uh, but he didn't call me <laughs> until after the third film came out. Mm -hmm. and said you know what they did to me wasn't fair. I said what do they do and he told me all the sort of details and I said yeah you got screwed <laughs> but um, I uh, you know was really happy to be sort of the glue that kind of held it together mm -hmm. because a lot of people didn't realize that it was a different actor and right. I think the you know I see where Zemeckis and Gale and Canton Spielberg and Marshall and Kennedy, where they were kind of stuck in a, a hard place because they didn't want to take you out of the, you know, the audience to be jarred from the reality of recreating those scenes that they need to be shoot for part two, chasing, you know, Biff with the almanac and all, mm -hmm. um, by having a different face, a different actor there. So they needed Crispin because of that. And so they used his, of course, his life mask to make the makeups that I wore. And I didn't know at the time, unfortunately, that uh, they didn't have his permission to use those. So, mm -hmm. and they weren't going to pay him for it. <laughs> so so wow. he had legal, legal grounds and, and the case, I believe the case never really went to court. I think it was settled as it was going to court outside of court. Yeah. He got three quarters of a million dollars or so. <laughs> well, you know, I mean, they're using his face. They should certainly pay. Yeah, well, you know, the it was pretty shifty. It was it was a kind of a rotten situation for all parties concerned, I think. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm 
uh, as well at the time, I was not allowed to promote myself or, or my work in the films because they wanted to keep me a secret. So Chris okay. wouldn't, wouldn't sue, I guess, uh, oh, yeah. or pay attention to it. And I didn't really benefit until many years later from my participation in those films. Hmm. The, uh, the fans, I, ironically, the DeLorean owners discovered me first and started bringing me to their conventions. <laughs> Um, yeah, cool. embracing me and then uh some of the cast reunions starting in 2008 uh, mm -hmm. i got to see you know friends that i'd made on set and uh it was just wonderful to get the fan appreciation from around the world now uh that mm -hmm. i was you know not getting yeah. Until yeah. fan cons so, right. yeah. so when you when you uh you finally are are you know, you're hired as the, the photo double. What was it that they said? You know, we need you to do the lines. We need you to start, you know, performing the the parts, you know, especially in the future scenes and such. That well, uh, you know, I, I, was, I was kind of kept in the dark until the 11th hour until hmm. casting finally called my agent. You know, hmm. meet him on set on Monday. Here it's Friday at 6 p.m. And <laughs> let's make a deal. I was like, what? Wow. I had, uh, like I mentioned, I went for prosthetic makeup fittings mm -hmm. and body cast special effects and i figured they needed storage in multiple places at the same time the agent that originally also supplied kevin holloway who was michael j fox's photo double okay and as you know while say michael from marty from part two is on the catwalk while marty from part one is playing mm -hmm. johnny be good on stage right. right you know kevin's up there on the catwalk while michael's getting the close-up or vice versa mm -hmm. so i figured they were going to need george in, in that type of situation mm -hmm. as well uh and then you know when i learned that crispin wasn't coming back it was actually the makeup designer ken chase who said you know crispin's out you're going to be george i was like <laughs> how, how is that possible Right. I couldn't fathom it because he was so solid in that mm -hmm. characterization. Mm -hmm. It was so wonderful and fun. Uh, and I had uh, done a, a screen test in the young George makeup that um, Robert Zemeckis, I remember asking Dean Cundy, the cinematographer, mm -hmm. what do you think, Dean? And and Dean saying, I think we got Crispin without the trouble. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, oh, wait a minute. What is that supposed to mean? Right. And, uh, you know, it, uh, it was odd. But you can see what that makeup looks like from the side. Oh, OK. Wow. Oh, wow. Jeez. That's yeah. incredibly. That's an incredible likeness. Wow. Yeah. So <laughs> uh, it, it really did look like him it was obviously from his life mask but hmm. from the front it didn't look so much like anyone right as you can see here hmm. so that's why i think because you know full front it didn't look so much and then it wasn't crispin they kind of kept me either in the background or out of focus when we went back to 1955 and recreated the enchantment under the sea dance or the fight mm -hmm. with biff in the parking lot Hmm. Hmm. but it's 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 really kind of interesting how they were able to to really pull that off i mean the makeup effects came such a long way in that time i mean yeah wow. i mean so so crispin's literally not in the movie at all in back to the future 2 he is not there at all no scenes um, were like shot or is there some yeah i think they used footage from the first yeah, they, film they, they, right exactly they they used a, a couple uh close-ups interspersed mm -hmm. with, with my work well, I gotta tell you, you did a good job because till Kyle told me this, I I thought it was the same guy. Bro. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, look yeah. at that. I mean, from afar, that looks incredibly. Uh, yeah, you know, I mean, just really good. Yeah, and about thirty-five percent of the people out there really didn't think there was any change in the actor, hmm. and and even to this day, there's people coming up to me saying no you weren't george and i said mm, yeah i was <laughs> right uh, that, that, i'm glad yeah, yeah. i'm part. glad they did it you know i'm glad they did it that way i mean because obviously we know you know claudia wells got replaced you know for two yeah. or three and, and it's a noticeable difference They're, they they mm -hmm. weren't trying to it was 
it's like introducing a new character in a way. And to do that with George McFly would have been very difficult. And then it would have really changed or, or they would have had to change the story and, you know, what they normally do and, you know, kill off a character or, you know, Oh, they're off on sabbatical. They won't be here for that, you know, or whatever changing the story. But the fact yeah. that the, because he was such a recognizable character with a distinguished voice and a look, Mm -hmm. to, to carry you through so i mean yes i mean it's kind of crappy what they did with crispin but at the same time try to keep that character going and obviously it's believable because rich didn't know the difference <laughs> <laughs> it's true I mean, his characterization of that of george mcfly was so fundamental to that first film to change it significantly would have been i think it would have harmed the yeah the film in some way but uh, you obviously were able to to keep that like you said you were able to be that that bridge uh, well, I it. had, I, I felt uh, very interesting work in 1987, in between TV work, I started performing uh, classic comic, Hollywood comic characters uh, at Universal Studios in Hollywood on okay. the tour. I started playing Stanley Laurel and learned how to get Stan Laurel's mannerisms and, uh, you know, take the heels off the shoe to get his physical. Mm -hmm. and, right. and then a year after playing Stan Paul, I started playing Charlie Chaplin. A year after that, I started playing Groucho Marx and studied the uh, postures and, and the Lazzi, the bits and the, you know, the various mannerisms. Hmm. And they gave me uh, screen tests and makeup tests for uh, Crispin and, and Tom and Leah. And I studied those. They got, got to spend some time on an OVHS uh, watching where his center of gravity was. You know, he leads kind of and he's kind of forward like this and his hand is like, you know, eh. you know, and so I got uh, the benefit of footage that has rarely if at all been seen in, mm. and the, studying the, and his other, hello. In fact, I, I remember after he got his settlement, I called Crispin and I said, uh, you know, actually he wouldn't take my call. <laughs> and and uh, his out, outgoing message on his answering machine was just him saying hello. And so one time I called him and said, hello, just like he did on the answering machine. And he kicked up <laughs> laughing, thinking, thinking that I was one of other friends. And I said, it's Jeffrey, you know, do you want to maybe decompress, debrief from all this Michigas? <laughs> and I, oh yeah sure sure yeah i'll get back to you haven't heard from him since oh <laughs> <laughs> well you tried I, you know <laughs> i understand yeah, yeah. where the is i mean he poured his soul sure into that first film he mm -hmm. first of all had months and months of rehearsal and mm -hmm. then six weeks of shooting with eric stoltz right so yeah. everyone Really, their characters down pretty pat and right. rehearsed very well. When I got thrown in to playing George, all of a sudden I had literally the script delivered on a Saturday, one day with the script, and then I was on set on Monday morning. And I was wow. like, wow. And I looked at my uh, part two, it was a script called Paradox. Mm -hmm. And they purposely called it Paradox because they didn't want to say Back to the Future sequel because people would have charged them an arm and a leg. It was it was the highest right. growth film in 85 right. you know, mm -hmm. on locations and rentals. They called it Paradox. Two and three were one. Yeah, they're, they're, let's make it two films. I don't know. Um, I looked at the script and I didn't really have time to make a lot of notes or changes in it or such. And I looked specifically at the scenes in 2015. Mm -hmm where I you know, would have a little breathing room to do some creative stuff, you know, Jeffrey Weissman as an actor, instead of imitating Crispin. Um, and when there are rewrites in a script, the pages, every rewrite gets a different color. Mm -hmm. And that right. kitchen scene, for example, in the McFly household of 2015, is a rainbow of colors. Because <laughs> they, they didn't know what they had, what, who, who they had, or right. uh, in one version, Marty is in the ortho lev being hung upside down. <laughs> and you know, what happened to your back, Marty? Uh, oh, I was playing squash, you know, yeah. went out, you know. Um, there have been statements and uh, this, you know, turning into 
urban legend or myth, uh, why he was hung upside down. Well, uh, yes, some people say, well, they wanted to obscure it was a new actor, um, which I don't think is really the case, though I've heard yet Bob Gale even say that. And I'm like, well, wait a minute, didn't you say elsewhere that uh, Bob Zemeckis and Robert Zemeckis and Bob Gale uh, were tired of Crispin overshooting or undershooting his marks? Mm -hmm. so let's hang him upside down and put him on this oh. rail so we can control him and we'll only be in focus for family. yeah you know so you hear all these different stories as mm -hmm. goes on and people spin different tales i know crispin has spun some very interesting tales and as a, anyway mm -hmm. i'm really uh, happy to be a part of the film set how long were you upside down for in those scenes this part? All, all day <laughs> uh, wow I had, um, I remember, well, first of all, you have to remember that we had Mike uh, only at night or on the weekends because he was shooting last season of Family Ties. Right, that's true. In the day. Mm -hmm. And so when we, we had Mike, we would try to shoot straight through. If we got him Friday, as soon as he got off, we would keep him until Monday morning when he had mm -hmm. to be back on the Paramount set. I said, Mike, when do you sleep? <laughs> Yeah, he said in the limo in between the studios. <laughs> wow, that, that's um, yeah, energy but, right uh, there. <laughs> Come yeah, energy. He, he's a feisty guy. So, <laughs> George, you know, starting from outside the the front door and making his way through the uh, living and uh, TV room and into the kitchen. Uh, we'd have some damn days. I remember one week and one week, my paycheck, my time card had a 1921 26 long day. And generally those had maybe, I don't know, there's a thing called turnaround where you had less than eight hours and the forced call before you had to be back in the makeup chair. And the makeup hmm. itself took four hours a day to apply another hour at the end of the shoot to remove. Hmm. Wow. So it's quite, a, quite an amount of time. In it, in yeah. It's it crazy, you, baby. I'm telling you, it was crazy. <laughs> you hear, yeah, you always hear about those people that are in the makeup chair and it's like, you know, three, four hours, some people even longer, you know, just to get the, the makeup right. All day. Yeah. Just, well, just to do yeah. That. With some of the creature makeups now, with these incredible creature effects that you have now I, i'm good friends with uh doug tate and and brian mm -hmm. Steele mm -hmm. and uh mr jones you know all these guys who play creatures and robots yeah. and various other things and uh you know they spend a lot of time in the effects trailer mm -hmm. chairs and body casts and so oh on my so. goodness yeah i mean i don't doug jones is is quite a uh, you know uh, yeah. Uh, quite the talent when it comes to playing creatures and robots <laughs> and he's a terrific guy and yeah. and they're all terrific guys you know I, I worked at universal with uh doug tate you know he was a frankenstein well before mm -hmm. he he's been doing the creature stuff now and and then creature boy himself brian Steele, who was robot on the more recent lost in space mm -hmm. you know yeah. he, he got because uh poor kevin was killed from pneumonia from the bodysuit on Harry and the Hendersons. Yeah. Brian then stepped in after Kevin passed away and he's just never looked back. You know, mm. he's he's just been working and working. I have, <laughs> if you guys would like to see, um, a little, little video that was cut from, it was deleted from the making of Back to the Future 2 mm -hmm. because, mm. you know, they wanted to keep me a secret. Sure. Um, yeah. So if you'd like to see it, it's a, sh a short video. Let me sure, try to Love to get it up here and do this share screen thing with that and do this. Uh-oh. Can you see anything? It, it Nothing's popped up, but yeah. I mean, I've, I've got the share, <laughs> but not the video. Okay. Well, where is it? There we go. How oh, about now? Can you see yep, it? Yep. We got it. Yay. All right. This should This should play. So this is Nancy Vasta uh, gluing my neck in. Behind you can see uh, Sonny Berman working on me on, uh, there's a better shot of Sonny. Uh, Leah is in the next chair being worked on by Mike Mills and Kenny Myers. Legends 
in the makeup world worked with us. Marvin Westmore of the famous Westmore family, even Zoltan and his wife came in and helped on days that, you know, there's five or six people needing to be put in prosthetic masks. Zoltan got the uh, Academy Award for mask. Yep. Mm -hmm. um, That's incredible. Yeah. So like I said, if, if I needed to be on the set by 9 a.m., I was in the makeup chair by 4, 4, 3. Mm. And, wow. Uh, after I mean, that... being uh, glued in into the process, uh, they then let me take a half an hour break for a breakfast burrito or something. <laughs> <laughs> well, that must have been so busy, especially for the 2015 scenes, because you've got Michael J. Fox. He's had three different characters, you know, playing. And then, you know, everyone had to be aged uh, a bit in those scenes. So they and, must have been quite a lineup. Then. Contributor of for the long, long days, because uh, we'd shoot with Mike as Marlene, and then mm -hmm. she'd go and get changed into Marty Jr., mm -hmm. and then he'd go get changed into Marty Sr. At, for all those scenes at the dinner table and such. Mm. And it, it would take once a, a two to three hours for Mike to get changed. Yeah, so you're shooting like Here's three different a, versions of the same scene, essentially. Yeah. That's right. Oh. Yeah. And I, I mean, just you, looking at these scenes from the, you know, the reshoots of the original film at the Enchantment of the Sea, I mean, it's, it looks like it was the original footage. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That's, that's incredible. Yeah. So it's really, really awesome. Really, really cool. And the, the cast was really, you know, really uh, great to work like they, they were very accepting of your coming in that was because sometimes you hear stories where they recast and it's always a little uh, oh yeah it was very awkward at first it's really cool yeah that's that panavision uh panaflex uh mm -hmm. vista vision that was run by the tondro program on a track mm -hmm. uh so the film is actually spliced inside the camera. Mm -hmm. Mike to play the multiple roles or Tom to play the multiple bits. Mm -hmm. uh, and we had to block the scenes and stick to that, nail it down and not veer from it at all. Wow. So wow. things like this always were problematic. <laughs> it must have yeah. made it a, quite a longer shoot then in those cases. I mean, just because of oh. the, you know, have to redo everything exactly the same way each time. Exactly. It was it was some very long uh, sh shoot days and nights. Like I mentioned, I, I remember uh, getting Zemeckis aside once in, because I was a huge Who Frame Roger. Oh, yes. And I said, you're going to do a sequel? Going to do it? It was like, nah, I don't know. But because the uh, the talks were that they were going to do a sequel. Right. Like Beetle. So, but, um, I said, because the complicated Locations of shooting live action on top of animation or vice versa. He goes, no, no, it, I have more compl complicated shots and effects on this film than I did on mm -hmm. Rocket. Wow, really? And I'm I remember sure, yeah. one of those, those really long nights, the, uh, you know, the, where Lorraine pulls the shade up on the projected view yes. on the McFly 2015 home, mm -hmm. and it's a brick wall behind. Mm -hmm. We couldn't get that properly were in the well Zemeckis figured it out and we came from dinner at 4 a.m. and and Bob Z said Leah why don't you just beat your line pull a string from all look at camera saying your line to Marlene and pull the string on your line and that way we won't see the flick of the projector turning off. And it worked and we went home. <laughs> Zemeckis was a great problem solver. It was mm. really, really lovely. And and yes, at first I remember that Enchantment Under the Sea Dance was one of the first scenes we shot. And when Mike and I came face to face when I was coming in, he saw the makeup and said, oh, Chris missing a little bit. I was like, great. Okay. <laughs> And and it took a while, even after the shoot, Leah didn't quite remember my her and her mom on the you know. <laughs> um, but over the years, 
very good friends. And at, at first, and I totally understand it, you know, I was this replacement that they worked with and trusted and loved. And, hmm. I don't know, Billy Zane, Billy Zane told me he thought that Leah was in love with, with Crispin. <laughs> well, <meant>. Yeah. <laughs> That's cool. That that's really cool. Now, with uh, moving into like uh, part three, you were uh, were you just in the scenes uh, towards the end of the film? Was that you know just uh... yeah? I remember um, some at one point while reading part two, saying uh, that you're doing. Uh, we'll give you a part in part three uh, without the makeup. Hmm. I was like, that, that would be nice. Yeah. <laughs> Cowboy or something. And I, I remember reading the script and finding the Western Union telegraph guy and thinking, hey, that's that's fun. I want to do that scene. <laughs> and when I brought it to Bob Z, or I'm sorry, Bob Gale, and he said, I think that's um, take a cast already. Yeah. And I went, okay, well, uh, how about something else? And he said, we'll find you something. Don't worry, don't worry, don't worry. And uh, it never happened. Oh. Oh, darn it but i got the one one day um uh after marty comes back mm -hmm. after clint eastwood comes back <laughs> and and uh i'm there in the background looking for my yeah. glasses lorraine have you seen my yeah. glasses I know. yeah oh, uh, awesome. but it was really good to spend you know uh some quality time with wendy joe sperber mm -hmm. and and uh and see the cast again mm -hmm. yeah that's Absolutely. really cool yeah at least you know at least you were there to, to experience it from the you know towards the end of the sure the shoot the so did story. they did they change anything with the the debacle and the change up with with crispin and you coming in did they change any of the script or any possible things where george mcfly would have had more of oh, a yes. role in either of the films yeah i i i had to fight to keep some lines hmm. I, I like I said the the rewrites were a rainbow of those scenes in particular right. 2015 McFly home and as Zemeckis was saying uh, Mike you take this line and Leah you take this line I was I raised my hand even though I was upside down I raised it upside down <laughs> I said hey I can act <laughs> <laughs> I might be able to take some of these lines sure. uh, and I and Zemeckis let me do a little bit of improvising I. Mm -hmm came up because my head, you know, at the front door was butt level with Marlene. <laughs> yeah. And they put her in these <laughs> orange hot pants or a little stuffed. Uh, I thought it looked like a pumpkin. So I came up with the house granddad's little pumpkin. Uh, <laughs> okay, it, that's it. Great. Yeah. it didn't translate. I recently saw it in Italian hmm. and I'm dubbed in Italian saying, how's granddad's little sparrow? I was like, no, it should be pumpkin. <laughs> and and i speak i'm dubbed in japanese really well i saw that just last year during the pandemic oh, okay you know, we have these fans from around the world mm -hmm. and we did a, i did a zoom with about two dozen of the japanese back to the future fans and every single one in the little squares were dressed as a different character from the films oh no kidding oh that's it was great. fantastic i just yeah I just <laughs> That's something to get a picture of for sure. <laughs> oh, the cosplay! I uh, oh yeah, I pre previewed for Kyle. Um, just when we were testing the the screen share, I probably can't find it now. Um, <clears throat> the cosplayers that I've met at the fan cons around the world have just been fantastic, really um, supportive and loving, and you know, want to be my friend forever. <laughs> um, this wonderful couple that came out to some of the events we've done. For Michael's charity here in the States, um, dressed their one year old uh, as the only old George McFly cosplay I've ever seen. <laughs> I mean, what a great idea. Yeah. That's awesome. That's, so that's, that's the hilarious. only old George <laughs> Ortholev cosplay I've ever seen. And he's one years old. Please, folks at home who are watching this, the child was upside down for only 10 seconds. There was no abuse. <laughs> going on <laughs> but yeah that's great i mean it, any of these these types of properties have they have such a, a huge fan base i mean it's always a you, you get so many passionate people that are 
you know, they they uh, they just want to share the the experience of what that movie means to them or what that you know whatever it is series or anything. I have some fans that write me every day. <laughs> I kid wow. you not. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, others, it, it, others once a week. <laughs> but it, it's such a. I mean, it, it was such a a huge part of uh, you know just uh, even myself and I know Don, you'd agree. To, to just our, our formative years that it just it really it, it meant so much especially when you know you saw the first film there wasn't supposed to be a sequel really um but when they finally you know twisted their arm enough bob gale and bob zemeckis to make the sequel we were fortunate enough to get you know the 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 sequels that they gave us which were great yeah, I my love understanding is uh, when it went to vhs they added to be continued at yes the, at the end yeah just it, as a joke as a joke yeah because right it wasn't an, originally it, there was nothing there it just ended with the the car coming towards the camera and then yeah when the vhs released they had to be continued everybody's like oh when's the sequel coming they're like there wasn't one plan exactly. and <laughs> you know it was very smart they uh, and then sequel mania took place in mm -hmm. the late 80s everyone right yep was doing some god awful television show remake or sequel to another film and finally the studio threw enough money at all the principal players they mm -hmm. said we're going to do this and and the get the bobs developed the script and shifted mm -hmm. from uh hippie george and lorraine to futuristic mm -hmm. so uh i remember because i was subscribing to variety and hollywood reporter at the time one of the headlines was called Back to the Bank, which basically was uh, talking about how many millions they threw at Chris Lloyd and Michael J. Fox to get them to yeah. come back and agree to do the sequels. Well, the, the building blocks were there. And building yeah. blocks of cash. <laughs> <laughs> That's cool. Yeah, I, I mean, and I mean, we got to I got to jump back a little bit before that, because you're still a part of so much of our once we you know we're doing an 80s podcast. So, I mean, Max Headroom, we were watching Scarecrow, Mrs. Mm -hmm. King, we were watching. And I got to got to talk about this because most people I don't know if everyone knows about this movie. And I know he had a very small part, but I absolutely love Johnny Dangerously. Yeah, oh, Johnny Dangerously. Great film. You know, I mean, it's just <laughs> yeah, it's like, and there's just so many cameos and so many great, great lines that I think I quote in my everyday life. But so it's just really cool that you were part of all of those, you know, things. And you know, and I, and I, I think I can honestly, Back to the Future, the first one was the favorite until two and three came out, and then I really, I feel like I, three was one of my favorites. But now, just after talking with you and and the connect that we have now with Back to the Future too, I'm like now I want to go back and watch it again and again. Um, and that's probably going to be my, my, my new, my new favorite. But I, I would, what I love about part two that I think a lot of people really don't, don't uh, uh, pay attention to is they really just deconstruct the first film. I mean, it's, it completely yeah. takes it and, and just pulls it apart. It looks at, it looks at it from another, it's so brilliantly done that no movie's really ever done it that way, um, which I thought was really, really great about it. Yeah. But, to well, go people... back to that original. Yeah. I'm often asked, you know, which what's your favorite of the trilogy? And for a while, I love I love three because of West the westerns and the Ooh. the uh, tribute to westerns it, it did. But but the and everyone expects me to say number two. But the first film really was my favorite. Yeah. Just mm -hmm. Really was fantastic. And I I was listening to an interview with with Robert Zemeckis, and he had said that two is probably his most interestingly just just his most it, it, the one that really stands out to him because he said the the way they handled that the way it was done he just says he wishes he was more hands-on with the editing because he was shooting three while they were editing two and it was right and and he would be up in sonora shooting mm -hmm. three and he would actually fly back to la to edit at night which wow. is crazy no. <laughs> it's insane it's like when do you sleep bob z right yeah now in today's day and age that's not an issue you know you got so much technology to to, to probably allow him to not have to fly but yeah back then i i uh, it was very uh special for me to work on johnny dangerously because i had been such a big fan of a lot of the principles on that i remember my day my work day was over but i hadn't met joe piscopo and i went over to yeah. his trailer and knocked on the door and said come in 
so I went in and just to tell him, you know, what a fan I was. And, mm -hmm. and uh, we spent about an hour chatting about how much he loved making movies and the mm -hmm. stand-up comedy and so on and so forth. Yeah. I uh, adored Mary Lou Henner, who showed up on a yeah. commercial shoot that I was on uh, and was a doll. And, and I remember seeing Maureen Stapleton coming uh. to the, the makeup trailer, <laughs> still in her house coat with her <laughs> newspaper under her arm, 7.30 <laughs> in the morning. I, I was already done with makeup. And I was like, I, my jaw dropped because here is the fantastic Maureen Stapleton, who I love yeah. from stage work. Sure. And without even looking at me, she said, it's, un, it's not polite to look at an old woman first thing in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was just that, that much alone was thrilling. So at, at uh, the rap party, I really wasn't making a living yet as an actor and uh, did catering jobs or valet parking in between different movie and TV work. And I got my catering company I was working for, got the rap party for Johnny Dangerously. Oh, cool. And at that rap party, they showed all the cut musical numbers. I don't know if you know that there were several musical numbers. I think they only kept Mary Lou Henner's. Um, oh, yeah. Really? Huh. And they showed them and I saw, we all saw why they were cut. It was like everyone was either off key or <laughs> flat or <laughs> hilarious. And I, I think it would almost add to that, uh, just the fact yeah, that it wasn't was, they, were, they were very funny musical numbers. <laughs> I thought it was pretty good, but it would have made it super long. So I was right. I was serving drinks to uh, Michael Keaton and Amy Heckerling, and Keaton <laughs> looked at me and he turned to Amy and says, "What well, wasn't he in the film?" You know. Like, yes, oh was. wow! Yeah, well, that's good. <laughs> that's awesome. Uh -huh. That's He's a such a talented uh, And I made friends, I made friends with Dom DeLuise, who was in, in my scene as the Pope. Oh, yeah. And uh, Dom yep. and I sort of stayed in touch. And he, when he got his candy camera redu redux over at Universal, he had my Oliver Hardy and me as Stan Laurel come and warm up his crowds and do comedy. Oh, cool. And then That's we, awesome. he would specially request us for like the opening of the Feifel Mouskowitz show, the American mm. Tale show, and for the special promo events. It, it was, Dom was really great to me. I remember him introducing me to uh, Mel Brooks and Ann Bancroft at oh, the cool. silent movie theater one night. He said, Mel, Ann, this boy, Jeffrey, would, when you see him as Stan Laurel, Charlie Chaplin, or Groucho Marx, you think they're there, he's good, blah, blah, blah. And I reminded Mel that I had, my Marx Brothers team had actually auditioned for him for Robin Hood Men in Tights. Oh, <laughs> and Mel said, yes, I liked you guys. I wanted you for the banquet scene, but the actor playing Don Corleone, the mafia boss, he wanted too much money. I had to cut somewhere and you guys went the way. Oh, At well, which point I realized was, that was, was played by Dom. Voice. So I just turned it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's funny. <laughs> oh, wonderful. That's, that's awesome. So that's great now that connect with that many, I mean, for, you know, small scene, normally you're only in the set for a short amount of time to be able to connect with all those, you know, all those great talents that were there. So, I mean, yeah, the experience on, on that movie had to been incredible. I, I can't help it. I love movie making. I love being a part of it, it but behind the camera and in front of the camera. The, one of the first ones film sets I was on, Sergeant Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band with mm. Peter Frampton and the Bee Gees. Mm. I'm, uh, I'm in four different scenes. I play Strawberry Fields' brother in one scene. I'm in the Earth, Wind, and Fire crowd, and uh, get brainwashed by Alice Cooper. <laughs> I remember there was a, a this blonde dancer named Cheryl who was, you know, doing these movements, and and I got bumped up to a SAG contract because I got to do some dance movements. Oh wow! And I I kept you know kind of flirting with this gal, and and on the second day uh, we went to lunch together, and uh, I was really kind of very excited that this girl I was getting ready to ask her for a date and on the third day you know Alice had been on the big screen and I think just had gotten out of rehab or something and was going to be there live on the third day of shooting that scene and uh, I remember getting out of wardrobe and makeup and going straight up to this dancer uh, Cheryl and and she saw me she said oh Jeffrey great I want to introduce you to my husband Alice <laughs> <laughs> wow. and you know they're still together it's that's a, been, that's great though same thing on on twilight zone movie oh, i love uh, I, I just i love watching garrett brown and his steady cam that was one of the first times he he really put it to work up and down back then it weighed 65 pounds or something yeah and and standing next to alan davio a lot of the time alan davio the cinematographer would put the camera where my seat 
was on the airplane because mm -hmm. they were shooting John from that angle. Right. John Lithgow, the uh, key, mm -hmm. key performer. And uh, I'd go to the back, back of the plane and hang out with some of these professional extras like Milton Burrell's brother, Jack, who would tell me the story of how Milton got kidnapped at gunpoint by Al Capone's guys in Chicago. You got to play my, you got to play my club. And Milton was like, no, no, no. And at gunpoint, he agreed to. Uh, and <laughs> then uh, a guy named Spaz with the giant Mohawk who had just come off Blade Runner where he had a fight with uh, Harrison Ford's character, mm -hmm. which got yep. cut. Uh, and then, and just adoring, having a great time with Donna Dixon. Oh, and, yeah. uh, you know, at the rap party, I was going to ask her for a date. And then uh, she re-met re with uh, Dan Aykroyd. She had just right. broken up with the, the cat from, from Kiss. Oh. <laughs> Stanley, Paul Stanley. Anyway, yeah, so I love finding out about the cameras and finding, finding about different crew positions and what they do. And just mm -hmm. loving it. And so I, I do some directing and, and producing and writing and I teach, I mentor oh, cool. and I coach actors all the time. Oh, that's fantastic. So that's, that's great. I love the process. Yeah. Oh, I mean, it just, even just the, the things you've, you've been involved with so far, it's just been, you know, it, it's made quite an impact. I mean, well, especially in the eighties. Yeah. Thank you guys yeah. for <laughs> finding me. Uh, well, thank you for for joining us. We really appreciate it. Listening to those stories, so seeing fun. those those pictures, uh, it's just wonderful. Uh, you know, uh, just hearing the, 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 the how that experience was for you. So it's great. Well, what, one of the uh, things that got me into Hollywood was screen testing for this film. Ah, War Games. A great. Yeah, uh, great the original movie. director Martin Brest mm -hmm. had told this agent that I was his favorite for the lead of David in that film, oh, and wow. it was a, called The Genius at first. I remember. Mm -hmm. um and this agent pursued me and i moved back to hollywood because of that i was actually doing my my studies at the american conservatory theater to get my master's and hmm. came back a little little quick and finally started working oh wow you've been busy since <laughs> that's yeah. great well i i just want to thank you so much for for joining us um and uh you know yeah, i'm sorry we lost rich goodbye rich yeah yeah goodbye. i think he, he might have lost his signal but we'll we'll catch him up when he uh he'll get to see it and hear it soon yeah. so no thank you so much i mean this uh, we love yeah we we like the process too i mean everything from watching it to you know being involved behind the camera in front of the mm -hmm. camera and learning all the nuances and and the stories that we just don't know that you know the so now when we watch it again we can appreciate it so much more like oh we Absolutely. know we know something you don't know or you know be able yeah, to share I've, the really i've got a great ton, of, ton of other stories you know could do a special on pale writers sometime it, I, absolutely uh, yeah we'll yeah, definitely yeah. definitely be uh, having you back for sure we We'd appreciate it Thank you, Kyle. Thank you, Don. Thank you Thank so much. You. I'll see you in the future. All right. <laughs>